It's not very often I say this. I genuinely have politicians sitting in the chair that I'm looking at right now. But a really incredible, incredible person. Her name is Natalie K. Rush. Now, you may recall Natalie K. Rush, many from some few crucial facts. In 2016, she was found in the street after her partner and father of her unborn child stabbed her 24 times uh, in the body, tried to slash her neck while... She was eight months pregnant. Uh, she was extraordinarily uh, left with a severed artery and effectively holding her intestines in her hands in the street. And quite amazingly, three years on, she is not just alive, she is well. Uh, she is campaigning. Uh, she's run five marathons back to back and she's written a new book. It's out today. It's called rather appropriately, still standing. Uh, good morning to you, Natalie. Good morning. I mean, I I remember this story being in the news and everyone being absolutely sort of, what? What's, a woman has been stabbed by her partner in the street. She's eight months pregnant and he was the father of your child. But I suppose one of the most shocking things about this is that um, you weren't in a violent relationship with this man. No. You, this, wasn't, this wasn't a long, ongoing battle of domestic abuse and there were plenty of warning signs and you'd known him 20 years You'd been his partner for a year and a half. Yeah, uh, so basically we'd known each other since we were 15 and um, we'd been at grammar school together, so we both came from a well-educated background and we sort of lost contact at university, but our wider friend circle stayed together and we got together in later life and, um, yeah, it was a very happy... I thought, um, loving, secure relationship. Yeah. And you, you, you wanted to have a baby together, you were eight months pregnant. The night before... What was he doing with you the night before this attack? So the night before, he was having to give a speech for a old boy society meeting and he was laid across my lap on the sofa, talking to the bump, talking to baby, going, hello, little girl, how are you? And she was kicking away and, yeah, we were just having a chat and a very relaxed, loving evening. There was absolutely not a clue that this was going to happen. So the next day, talk us through what actually happened to you. So the next day, completely standard day. Um, I was actually off work, so about to start maternity leave, being eight months pregnant. And um, I did all the usual things. He got up, hugged, kissed. He went off to work. See you later. But he arranged for me to meet him at the bank. We had some money to sort out. And the day passed by and eventually we talked lots of times and I left the house to go and meet him and I actually spoke to him on the way. This is the incredible thing. I actually talked to him as I walked to Sutton Town Centre, so about 20 minutes before the stabbing began. And as I approached the town centre, I could hear him sense someone was following me and he basically grabbed me. I didn't know it was him. He was fully in disguise. And um, while I'm screaming for them to get off, assuming I'm being mugged, not thinking that possibly that anything else could happen, I saw this 12-inch carving knife, which then went into my chest and the stabbing began. And he stabbed you, as I said, some 24 times uh, all across your chest, your your, your neck. Yeah. Um, and there were other people around in the street. Yeah, so two guys came running and they jumped on top of him. It was incredibly brave. You know, in our society today, you don't know what you're going to be faced. They tackled him, took him down, but he still held on to me and carried on stabbing me. And I couldn't understand. I was screaming, why me? What have I done to you? Well, and did, did, he, did he speak at any he point? He literally didn't say a word. Not a word. And eventually one of the guys held his arm back and I broke free and um, got to my feet, somehow I'd been stabbed 20 times at this point, holding my bump, stumbled down the hill but collapsed. And um, he then broke free as well and he followed me down the hill. He walked down the hill very calmly and he then proceeded to cut through my wrist, stab me in the belly <laughs> and then tried to cut my throat, which luckily for me, an 18-year-old lad came running around the corner and ripped him off me just at the crucial I point. Mean, incredibly brave, as you say, the yeah. people... the, 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 the people not bystanders, the good Samaritans who stepped in. An ambulance was called, police yeah. were called, he was taken away, uh, you were taken to hospital. Tell us about what happened there. Yeah, so I was airlifted, thank God, out of the town centre and um, the flight was only eight minutes to the hospital, but they reckon I had less than five minutes left to live when we landed. So if I'd gone by land, mm. I would have died somewhere in the back of a land ambulance. Um, Presumably losing copious amounts of blood. Yeah, so... And, and at this time also, you're not just worried about your own life. You worried about the life of your yeah, unborn baby? Yeah, they kept asking me, how's the baby? Is the baby moving? And to be honest, I had to block it out because 
Um, she wasn't moving. I knew I'd been stabbed in the stomach and I couldn't contemplate. In order for me to survive, I had to just focus on staying calm. And um, they landed at the hospital and took me straight into theatre. And I was five hours in theatre and during that time they did an emergency caesarean section where they took the baby out. They had to resuscitate her. It took about five attempts. Had she actually been stabbed? Um, the blade, unbelievably, missed by two millimetres is apparently what the medical reports say. So... Absolutely extraordinary. So she survived, unharmed? She um, she's had severe oxygen starvation, as you pointed out. Obviously, I lost a lot of blood, which meant that she was starved of oxygen whilst in the womb. And when she was resuscitated, it took a long time to resuscitate her. So long term, we don't know if there is going to be some damage to that brain damage. That we know that she did sustain. But she's an incredible girl. She's a little fighter. She's very happy, very strong. She's beautiful, funny, very proud of her. And if she's got learning difficulties, we'll deal with it. Um, sounds like, yeah, you could deal with anything. Now, you're sitting here in front of me looking very beautiful, very glamorous. Um, I can't see a mark on you. Um, you you seem to have made a, a remarkable, a miracle recovery. But I imagine it's been a rather longer road than it would appear right now three years on. Yeah, it has. And obviously the, the, um, the beauty of fake tan to cover the marks. But, um, yeah, it has been a really hard journey. And I think that's the thing I want to get out there is even at your darkest point, you can get back. But it's not some fairy tale. It doesn't just happen. It's not linear. You don't just suddenly increase, get better. And there are days that are really good. There's days that are really tough. And even even now, days can catch me and it can be really hard again. But people need to understand is you can get there and you set yourself a little goal, set yourself a vision and just keep going. Well, you've done some amazing things since then. But I imagine a lot of the recovery is trying to come to terms with why a man who told you he loved you, behaved in a loving way to you, wanted a baby with you, would try to murder you and your child in such a horrific fashion. Yeah. Has he ever told you why he did it? He can't explain it. In court, it was put down to the fact there was the cultural differences and that his family didn't accept me. And what, and what were those cultural differences? Me. Um, he came from a Muslim background. He was from a traditional... Is, is Bobby, Pakistan... Bobby Karamat Raja is his name. Yes, yeah. so traditional Pakistani Muslim background from his mother and father from Pakistan. But he'd been brought up in St Coalfield. He'd gone to a very mixed school, mixed university. Um, so he'd been, you know, sort of in a society where... It was completely mixed, and the irony is his sisters were married to white men. Um, but I, he was the eldest boy, and I was not to be accepted. Um, and there's financial pressures that, that, with his business. Yes. That, that, could, that could be a reason to leave you, as opposed Correct. to... And, and has, he ever, has he ever said sorry? Has he ever expressed any urge to see his daughter? Um, yes, to both of those. He has said sorry, but in a very calm and detached way. I went to visit him um, in my book, Still Standing. Um, it's not a spoiler, the end of it is actually the day I finish. Um, is when I go to prison. Yeah. And um, I face him and there's a lot of detail about our conversations in there. And he was very calm and very relaxed. So for a man who put it down, they put it down to this temporary adjustment disorder that all this pressure caused him to have a meltdown. And um, if, therefore, that was the case, when I faced him, you'd expect him to be beside himself, like, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe, you know... It wasn't me, I was out of my yeah, head. Yeah. yeah, but he was very calm, and he did say sorry, but it was quite detached, he talked, he, he was fascinated by my scars. Um, yeah, I took photos of my injuries to try and drive home how bad it was to him, and... Um, I just had to face him. People say, why did you face him in prison? I had to look him in the eye and I wanted to speak that to him That was part of your, your road to recovery that you yeah. needed. How long did it take for you to do that? Do you know, it took nearly a year. And I'll be honest, I had to really fight the system to get in. The system's very much geared up to protect the perpetrator rather than the victim. And it's all about what impact it would have on him rather than the fact that I needed to see him. And he agreed to see me, but even then I still had a big fight in my hands, but I was determined to be in that prison and face him. Now, well, he is behind bars. Do we know how long for? Yeah, he got 18 years. Um, however, he's got to serve a minimum of 12. So potentially nine years, he'd be due and eligible for parole. Um, obviously, I hope he serves his full sentence, if only to protect... Um, my daughter. Cause, um, she, and how much does your daughter know? I mean, she's only, what, three years old? She's three years old. She knows that mummy was poorly the day she was born. She knows that mummy went in a helicopter, a big red helicopter. So the Midlands Air Ambulance helicopter, she sees it anywhere. She's like, mummy's, mummy's helicopter. <laughs> so I, I clearly own a fleet of helicopters <laughs> now, which I never knew about. And... Um, so she just knows that mummy was poorly, she was poorly, and we're going to get better. And I've had a lot of advice from child psychologists how I build this story up, and she has to know about it because obviously it was all in the media before I was even yeah. 
out of hospital, I was in a coma. It was being broken. But the knowledge that your dad tried to kill your mum and tried to kill you unborn is going to be devastating. It is going to be horrific, and that's why I've taken so much advice from child psychologists because it breaks my heart. I look at this little girl who's so happy, so smiley, and she's got a horrible, harsh reality to still face. Now, you have faced up to that harsh reality. You've had no choice about doing that, but you have done some amazing things since. Um, in particular, you mentioned Midlands Air Ambulance Charity. You owe your life to them. As you say, you wouldn't have made it if you'd gone by a road ambulance and you've been raising money for them. Tell us the stuff you've been doing. Oh, gosh. In between writing your yeah, book. Yeah, in between writing the book, I, I mean... Less than six months after the attack, I did one of these extreme obstacle courses, 10 kilometre. My left hand is quite severely damaged from the attack. I just had it operated on, so I was doing obstacles, essentially one-handed, being shoved at walls and jumping through mud. Um, and that was after... I mean, whatever, whatever floats your boat, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Le- less than six months after a major cesarean section, major attack and not being able to walk. But yeah, um, I've done things like I ran an eight and a half mile run in the heat in one of their flight suits. I did the five marathons back to back um i've done sort of 240 foot ab sales the wires you name it um you're so a lunatic any basically. ideas <laughs> people want to tweet any ideas at nat q lee any ideas for another how, crazy how much have you raised stone? in total do you think I don't know. It's thousands, literally thousands and thousands, and I do a lot of group activities. And um, I've been doing things for some of the charities. I work for a charity now as well, so I changed my life by leaving the pharmaceutical industry. I had some, a very supportive company in pharmaceuticals, and um, but I just wanted to change but my life and career. You've also been talking to a lot of children in deprived areas about, about the effects of knife crime, the yes. reality of this. Of course, knife crime very much in the news yeah. uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, that the message out, you know, getting out there to children, that, you know, this, this this is the real life effect. Yeah, of I want to say crime. this is what it's like to be at the end of that knife and also say to them, they might look at me and go, oh, but you've survived. And then I say, I survived because the police arrived immediately on the scene. They did and first the, aid. And, and the other the air onlookers who, who, who were there yeah. to pull him off you. People did first aid straight away and air ambulance came out. I said, if you were in a park and that happened, someone might not find you. And as soon as that knife is in you, your clock is ticking, you're bleeding internally. And I think the reality of that really hits kids and I've seen that effect with them. And I hope to continue to do a lot more talks in schools. Well, I, I just think you're amazing. <laughs> I, I can see that uh, everyone, everyone in the team has just been sitting there listening absolutely agog to your story. The book is brilliant. Uh, Natalie K. Rush, it's the brilliant book. It's out today. It's called Still Standing. You are an amazing woman. I'm, I'm just going to help you with just the spelling there because it doesn't spell like K. Rush. It is a Q-U-E-I-R-O-Z so it makes it a bit easier to find that book still sounding it's released today on your bookshelf today get it on Amazon or whatever but it is a, it's, it's an amazing book about an amazing journey by frankly an amazing woman thank you so much for coming thank in you. we feel privileged thank to have you here in the studio